So, welcome to the fourth lecture on module 2 that is on allocation and binding algorithms. So, in the last uh, couple of lectures what we have seen that uh, the high level synthesis problem comprises three steps scheduling, allocation and binding. Then we define what are the problems in formal terms and then we have seen that we require some automated CAD tools or algorithms which can go on given a circuit or given some specification. So, you can automatically get what you call a scheduled design, an allocated design and a binded design kind of a stuff. So, in the last couple uh, last uh, double lecture, so what we have seen, we have seen some automated algorithms like uh, uh, what you call the, the uh, as soon as possible, as late as possible, then force directed, least scheduling and finally, integer linear programming that is ILP based solutions or ILP based algorithms. All these with some algorithms where given a input specification, they will give you a schedule design based on some timing constraints or based on some resource constraints where, as in the case. So, I mean uh, then what we found out that uh, as already discussed in the high level synthesis problem the after the scheduling has been done then you have to go for scheduling then you have to go for allocation and then finally, you have to go for binding. So, I mean after so as we were discussing some automated tools or algorithms. So, we have given an input specification you can either use some of the heuristics like uh, FDS or as soon as possible as late as possible or least scheduling or even if you have enough time I mean it takes prohibiting amount of time for the ILP, but if still if you have time you can use an exact algorithm then you can get a schedule design based on your time constraints or your uh, resource constraint. Now, once this is done, so this is your input to the next two steps of allocation and binding. So, now we will be looking in this lecture we will be looking at the algorithms which will take uh, take you through the other two steps of the high level synthesis procedure that is allocation and binding. So, if you recall, so what was scheduling? Scheduling means uh, you have been given uh, all the all these operations like addition 1, add O1, O2, O3, addition 1, addition 2, subtraction 1, subtraction 2 kind of stuff. So, all the operations will be given some time steps of operation. Then this is actually called the solution, this is called the scheduling. So, after the scheduling has been done, you have to go for allocation and then finally, binding. So, what is allocation? So, if you remember what is allocation? So, allocation means there will be a lot of resources in the hardware like Hadipal carry adder, um, array multiplier, then some sequential multiplier and so many so forth different hardware units may be available in your library. Then you have to allocate different hardware units for different operate operations which is already been scheduled. Like for example, for adders you may require a very slow adder it may do your function I mean as for discussed in the first lecture of this module. So, a slow adder may do your purpose. So, you can use a triple carry adder, but sometimes you require a very fast multiplier. So, you can use a what you call array type of a multiplier that that will actually give you a very fast solution rather than a sequential type of multiplier. So, that means in <coughs> allocation step, uh, so uh, in what you do we allocate different uh, hardware by looking at the design library to all the operations. So, you can think that this does not merit a independent algorithm study. So, uh, or the idea is the, even if there are some algorithms, so there will be a very semi automated for semi automated type of an algorithm. So, or in which case some manual intervention will be required because just after uh, if you just look at uh, what is your scheduled uh, stuff and then how the scheduling has been done then by looking at all these things you can decide what type of adders, what type of multipliers and what type of dividers or what type of hardware units for hardware functional units required for doing the operations. So, in that case I mean there is no such direct algorithm which requires to do the mapping. You can find out what is the time taken, what is the time steps, you know what is the delay of each of the adders or each of the hardwares you know and then you can decide on the time step delay or the time or time given to each time steps in the uh, in the control structure at this time step 1, time step 2, what, what if you assume a uniform delay, then what will be that delay amount based on that you have to select what is the hardware type you want. So, in the first lecture example we have seen that we require a very fast multiplier, but a slow adder will do the job for us. So, based on the such type of studies we select we allocate scheduling we allocate different hardware for different operations. So, you can understand that we do not have require a, it is not a very sophisticated procedure neither it requires a too much of an algorithm automated algorithm to do it. Just by looking at some of the parameters the you can decide on the allocation procedure. In other words, if even if I should not say that there is no algorithm, but even if there are some algorithms, they will actually aid the designer. They can tell help to find out what is the power requirement of the different uh, hardware units that is available in the library. They can tell you what is the delay of those stuff, then what is the delay that uh, that is tolerable for each of the control step and so forth. So, some of the information you can gather out from the from the designs using some tools and then you can decide on what are the <coughs> what units are to be allocated for what operation. So, in this course, we are not going into depth of so such semi automated algorithms or whatever I say semi automated procedures rather we think that I mean it is an easy type of a job and even if there are some algorithms they will just give you some information about the different hardware units and the delays tolerable in your design or that is your control step delays and all this stuff. So, so those informations will be gathered by some of the tools and based on that the designer can do what the designer can 
allocate different hardware units from the design library to each of the operations. So, what we will see next that is the actually the binding step. So, after the allocation has been done that is all the control steps have been given some operations is shielding process allocation is allocating different hardware units from the design library to these operations. Then we have to go for the binding step ok that is the binding step. So, already discussed in the first lecture of this module that we have three type of binding that is functional unit binding that is addition of multiplication subtraction those things has to be binded to different hardware units that is available because if we require three adders in one step. So, that is the maximum number of adders say required in one control step. So, you will have three adder units and all other addition operations will have to be shared within those functional units like we have we have adder 1, adder 2 and adder 3. So, different addition operations say O1, O2, O3 dot 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 ON. So, all these operations has to be binded to within these three adders that is all these adders addition operations will be shared among these three adders. So, that is how which addition operation you will bind to which hardware unit or which hardware unit among the three adder adders you want to do these operations with is actually called the binding step uh, or precisely the functional unit binding. Then we have seen the storage to register binding. So, we will have some n number of storage elements or registers then you have to find out which of the registers will be used to store which variable. So, that is actually called the storage register or storage or register binding and data transfer to interconnect binding that is because of this type of uh, sharing of resources we require some multiplexer arrangements and interconnection between uh, hardware units, functional units to storage units and so forth. So, this uh, this actually uh, I mean uh, uh, that uh, that actually controls the data transfer that is putting up multiplexers and wirings for, for doing this functional unit to storage register and storage register to functional unit data transfer. We may require some multiplexing arrangements, some wire connections. So, those actually comprise your interconnect or data transfer or interconnect binding. So, already we have seen that there are the three different types of bindings. So, now we will see some uh, general algorithms which can actually help you do this binding procedure ok. So, now before we go to the automated algorithm. So, what we will see first we will take a very simple example like out 1 equal to a plus b plus c and out 2 is equal to d plus e plus f. So, these are the two uh, operations we want to carry out. So, we will see those and what we will try to derive we will find out that based on different type of bindings you do for storage as well as uh, this two function unit and storage register storage to register binding. So, based on different type, type of uh, uh, storage register and uh, what do you call the functional unit binding we will see that automatically the third part that is your uh, data transfer or interconnect binding area changes that is very important. So, what is that what is the goal I mean what how do you generally go about solving the problem. So, what do we do we first go for functional unit binding then we say that we will go the register unit binding I mean we should not say that it is they are all separate actually they are hand in hand. So, they actually go hand in hand. Let us see how it goes hand in hand. Say for example, we have to start at one point. So, let us start with functional unit binding then what we do they will go for the storage register binding and then finally, we will find out that once these bindings are done automatically uh, this data uh, transfer binding will come into picture because you have to put multiplexer and wiring. Then you will find out that based on these two the area of the third step will actually vary. So, if you want to minimize this area then you have to again tweak with this two stuff. So, that is why we call it hand in hand. So, if you if for some cases the area will be very high for some case the area will be very low in this case. So, you have to adjust this first two parameters like param function unit binding and storage to register binding these two you have to adjust accordingly. So, that you get minimum uh, interconnect binding. So, we will see algorithms that will actually take care of take care of this procedure into picture that this factor into picture rather I should say. So, before that we will give you an example using a very small I mean uh, expression that how it exactly happens that how based on functional unit binding and the register binding your uh, interconnect binding area will change. So, let us think that A plus B plus C and this is the case. So, I mean let us this be the scheduling by based on some as late as possible or whatever you take. So, O 1, O 2, O 3, O 4 these are the schedule step it is done and then you can think about the allocation say we use all ripple carry address because maybe the speed or the time uh, time step. Now this time for each control step is so that a time a ripple carry adder frequency or rip time taken by a ripple carry adder to do the job is enough that means this delay. So, we have taken ripple carry adder that is actually the uh, allocation has been already been done with ripple carry adders and schedule is O 1, O 2, O 3, O 4 as shown in the figure. Now, we have to go for binding. So, you can see that as we have only two uh, adders in uh, in one uh, time step. So, you can easily vi uh, visualize that what is the idea that we have two adder blocks maximum. So, two adders are required now you have to allocate bind actually O 1, O 2, O 3, O 4 to this adders. So, you can think that I will do O 1, O 2 here and O 3, O 4 here this is going to be one of binding that is actually we are doing functional unit binding as I told you we initially do functional unit binding. We can also think it that way that we will do O 1, O 4 here and O 2, O 3 that is all possible permutation 
combinations can be attempted because you have two adders and four oper addition operations. So, they have to be shared in between this two adders. Okay, then you have to see for uh, say for we will take all the different different uh, uh, binding uh, allocation uh, sorry different different binding uh, uh, different uh, binding uh, permutation and combinations that are possible that we will take and then we will see what is the area over it due to the uh, interconnect binding that automatically comes in uh, comes up into the purview. So, now also we have some of these. So, uh, this is say say we want to take we will take this one. So, O 1 and O 2 are binded with adder 1, O 3 and O 4 are binded to adder 2. So, this one is for adder 1 and this one and this one for adder 2. So, two adders are there. So, adder 1 will be doing this two operation, adder 2 will be doing this of this two operation. So, this is about the functional unit binding we have done. Now, you can see that what are the variables so that we can go for register binding. So, you can see that A, B, C, D there are four uh, variables are there. So, they are alive in one go. So, minimum four registers has to be there. You cannot use three registers because A, B, C, D they are all appearing in the first time step. So, there are four registers to store that you cannot reuse like in this case we have two address in one control step. So, at least two address max minimum at least two address you have you need to have otherwise you cannot go for this uh, what you what you say execution of the process execution of the circuit. So, uh, similarly we have four registers over here four variables over here. Here A B C D. So, 4 registers minimum are required. So, we can say that R 1, R 2, R 3 and R 4 minimum are there and then what you have to do? You have to allocate uh, sorry you have to bind A B C A B D E to these things and what are the some other variables like temp 1 will be generated after the first addition is done C is another variable temp 2 is another F is another and finally, out 1 and out 2 are generated. So, you can think that as A B C D are all alive in time step 1. So, they have to be binded to different. So, I say like this A R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4 I say A B uh, and I say that say D and E. So, this is one stuff I say A B D E A B D and E they have to be all allocated at uh, 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 to different registers sorry binded to different registers A B D and E A B D and E because they are, are all happening in the first time step. So, you cannot share any register among them, but now you can see that after uh, this A plus B has been done then register R 1 is free. So, I can say that I can use it for temp 1. Okay. So, I can bind temp 1 with that and uh, B will also be free in that time step 2. So, I can say that B and C say I actually put it in register 2 this way I can do. Similarly, in case of uh, this stuff so you can see that R 3 will be 4 after R 3 will be free after D and E has been added. So, you can put temp over here temp 2 over here okay, because temp 2 you can store it in the register number 3 and uh, then what you can say that after uh, the addi first addition D plus E that register 4 is also free. So, you can allocate F to this one right. So, it has been done and then after in the final step out 1 and out 2 will be ready. So, when the when out 1 and out 2 will be arriving all the registers will be free. So, you can store out 1 and out 2 anywhere accepting you cannot share them. Okay, So, you can say that in register 1 I put out 1 Okay, and in register number 3 I can put out 2. So, any, any of them you can try out. So, first you have to add 4 variables 4 registers. So, 1, 2, 3, 4 will go over there then any one of them you can reuse for temp 1 and another for C 3 C because temp 1 and C cannot be overlapped because they are having same lifetime similarly temp 2 and F they also cannot be overlapped with this one. So, temp 1 C temp 2 F they have they can be uh, binded to uh, different 4 registers as we have and then finally, when the second series of additions are also done then out 1 and out 2 will be ready. So, they can be again stored in 2 different registers because I mean out 1 and out 2's life is not overlapping with any one of these variables. So, let us see the first this one uh, first uh, what you can first option of binding. So, 1 O 2 O 3 O 4 are been added I mean I have been binded to register 1 adder 1 and adder 2 respectively. Now, in variable re register number 1 they have done A temp 1 and out uh, register 2 they have done B C variables uh, D temp 2 and out has been binded to register 3 and E and F has been binded to register 4. So, that has been already binding is already we have done. So, these are your operational uh, unit binding and these are your register or storage binding you have done. Now, you see automatically will be re requiring some multiplexers uh, uh, multiplexers will be automatically required to to do the interconnections because you can see in uh, register A you will be storing A then temp then out 1 in this case you will be storing B C in this case you will be storing D temp 2 and out. So, different variables will come to the registers. So, obviously you require multiplexing. So, when you require multiplexers when through a channel different variables are expected to arrive then use a multiplexer. So, you can see the temp 1 to register 1 okay, uh, via multiplexer is binded to data transfer this one. So, what it is saying that temp 1 is actually bringing uh, a temp 1 a plus b. So, a plus will be uh, binded to register 1 via some multiplexer. Now, why it is uh, multiplexer is required because input a is also binded to register 1 that is data what is the data transfer reading a from input bus and also same register r 1 temp 1 is binded where the data is arriving from 
uh, arising from this operation a plus b. So, obviously, we require a multiplexing over here that is what is being told over here. Okay. So, uh, that let us see the figure then again we will come back. So, what we are seeing telling you that so, a temp 1 and out 1 are binded to register 1 okay. then b and c to register 2, d temp 2 and out 2 this one is out 2 is binded over this one and e f n has been binded to register 4. Now, let us see what happens. So, when you say that first step that is a plus b. So, uh, a, a now you see that uh, this some register is there. So, what is being going to the register a is going to the register that is from input bus. Uh, temp 1 is also be coming to here that is actually from the output of this adder. So, that is actually say temp 1 and then finally, after all the operations out 1 will also go, go, go to register in 1 and it will be stored in register 1. So, that is uh, again uh, temp 1 and out 1 is coming from where temp 1 and out 1 is coming from the output bus of the adder. So, output bus of the adder is 1 pin which is connected to the register and A is 1 pin which is connected from the input bus to the register. So, you require a 2 is to 1 one multiplexer. So, had it been the case that out is arriving from some other place uh, in from some other circuit and so forth let us assume. So, it could have been say that it is coming from this circuit. So, in that case you would have required a 4 is to 1 multiplexer because the fourth pin will be re not reused in this case, but then two uh, buses would not have been uh, or 2 is to 1 multiplexer would not have done the job for you because you require 3 pins I mean 3 input ports or 3 ports from where the data is being uh, data is arriving. So, in this case as there are only 2 uh, I mean 2 connections or 2 lines from where the data is arriving driving excuse me. So, you can think that 2 is to 1 must be satisfied. Now, in this case, so that is actually the story about register 1. Now, in register you see, you see B and C. So, now you can think that why do I now have not put a register B and C over here. Sorry, I have not put a multiplexer over here and I put B or C here. Why I have not done that? Rather, I have directly connected B and C over here. The answer is simple. Actually, B and C are connected directly to the input port input port is directly connected and in this case what happens in time step 1 B is available and in time step 2 C is available. So, you do not actually require 2 different ports to or 2 different interconnects to connect to the register because it is kind of directly connected to the only one line that is input port where in time step 1 B is available and in time step 2 C is available. So, we do not require a multiplexer even though 2 variables are binded to this one. Similarly, in case of this register number 3, so 1 port is D that is control step 1 where the data is coming from the control bus. So, sorry input bus and then time steps time 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 step 2 temp 2 will be generated by adding d plus e. So, you require where the data will be arriving here from another line that is the output of register number 2 uh, sorry output of adder number 2. So, you require a multiplexer over here and finally, out 2 will be generated which will also be binded to register 3, but in this case what happens if you see that is the same output port of the adder is actually bringing temp 2 and out 3. So, you do not have any a third pin. So, a 2 input uh, 2 by 1 multiplexer is actually doing the job. So, what you have found you have found out. So, in this case uh, at time step 1 1 A is going over here to the register, B is going over here, addition is done, temp 1 is generated, which is stored at via marks is again stored at register number 1. Okay. After that, what happens? Out 1 is added to B, out, sorry, out 1 is added to C, it will generate out 1. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Temp 1 is added with uh, that is in, uh, in time step 1, you are adding A plus B and generated temp 1. Okay, which is stored at the register 1 through the second pin that is through this pin it is stored over here. Now, in the time step 2, what is happening? Temp 1 is added to this C, this plus C and you are generating out 1. So, again the out 1 is again fed, uh, out 1 is generated by the adder in time step 2 and in time step 3 what happens? The same variable this out 1 so is actually coming out of the adder and is being stored in register number 1 via this multiplexer. So, this is what is the 3 step that is in being done. So, in this case first step B is there, uh, second step C is there. So, that is automatically happening from the input bus. So, we do not require an extra multiplexer over here. So, that is what being how the this is how the sequence of in time step 1 and time step 2 what happens we are actually generating A plus B and then temp 1 is added with C to generate out 1. Similarly, in this case in uh, time step 1 uh, D is being fed to register 1 by this port okay, and it is uh, being added with E, the E is coming from the input port via register 4 that is being added and you are generating the value of temp 2. So, temp 2 is stored over here and in control step 2 temp 2 is this temp 2 is added over F and we are finally, getting out 2 which is again stored over register 3 by this output of adder number 2. So, this is how you are generating uh, what you say temp 1 and temp 2 uh, plus C and in this case plus F and finally, we are generating out 1 and out 2. So, uh, by uh, the this, this binding if you are actually having this binding. So, what are the uh, interconnect binding? You require actually one multiplexer over here and one multiplexer over here. So, in a nutshell what we have seen that if you are going for this type of operation and variable binding the time uh, what you call the marks required is actually 2 which is the interconnect binding over here and some of the wirings you can see they are also actually come under the interconnect binding. Okay, now, we will see other options because only one option we have seen 
16. In this case, we have uh, added O1, O2 over here, O3 and O4 here and then we have gone for A temp 1 out 1, B C A temp 2 out 2 and E F in this case. So, this is one option. So, let us and the area was 2 multiplexes with this type of wiring. Okay, now, let us take uh, one more option, uh, uh, one more option in this case, uh, one another two, three options we will see for different type of bindings and we will see the interconnect area. Okay. So, uh, in this case uh, whatever I have told you that why do you require a register and all. So, we, why do you require a multiplexer at some points and why, right, like why do you require a multiplexer here and why do not you require a multiplexer over here etcetera written in the thesis, I mean sorry written in this uh, slide. So, you can go through this, uh, go through the write up what I have told you the same thing is mentioned in this slide. Okay. Now, we are going for another uh, option of binding. So, what is the next option of binding? So, in this case we are actually saying O 1 and O 4 in rather 1. So, if you recall, so in this case it was O 1 and O 2. So, now we have made it O 4 and in this case it is o, o 3 and O 2. Okay. So, this 4 has gone there and 2 has come over here. So, that is what we have done over here. So, you can see that we are saying that O 1 and O 4 are binded to other 1 and O 2 and O 3 has been binded to other 2. So, that are some different stuff we have done. And again some permutation combinations also we have done over here. So, variable A temp 1 and out 1 are stored here. So, initially it was temp 1 now we have made it to temp 2 A is binded to register 1 B and F has been binded to register 2. So, initially it was B C now we have made it B F because actually 4 is coming over here for adder 1 4 1 in adder 1 now we are actually op doing operation O 1 and O 4. So, O 4 is actually taking temp 2 plus uh, F. So, we are actually allocating uh, binding uh, temp 2 to register 1 and f 2 register 2 kind of a thing and similar in the similar way d temp 1 and out 2 are binded to register 3 and e and c are binded to register 4. Okay, so, now let us see in this slide I mean in this slide how it what we have done. So, in this case initially it was adder 2 now it is adder 4 uh, sorry operation 4. So, operation 4 actually takes temp 2 and f. So, instead of having temp 1 here and c over here we have made it b and made it temp 1 because if it is add o 2 then it actually adds temp 1 plus c. So, that would have there was a previous case. So, now we have put o 4 over here. So, we are actually uh, we are putting temp 2 over here and f over here. Similarly, we are taking o 2 over uh, sorry o 3 over here. So, so in this case uh, so, in this case if you see, so it is O 3 over here. So, if you take a O 3 over here. So, in this case so O 3 will be actually temp 1 plus C. So, that will generate actually out 1. So, in this case instead of having a temp 2 uh, in the previous case and F over here. So, we have replaced it with temp 1 and C. So, by doing this what we are achieving? By doing this what, the, what we have achieved is that we have actually brought this uh, O 2 over here. So, O 2 will be adding uh, temp 1 plus C. So, some allocation sorry some binding we have reshuffled it. Okay, now, if you can also see in this case also. So, uh, our uh, uh, multiplexer required will be 2 as we will very sh shortly see. So, but one thing I should tell you that we are not I mean uh, in this case we are just start starting some arbitrary bindings. It is not that that we have saying that O 1 and O 4 and O 3 and O 2 has been done here. That is why we have replaced temp 1 with temp 2 and in this case if you have replaced temp 1 with temp 2 I mean that is we have just swapped these values corresponding to the uh, compared to the previous example previous case of by, by, uh, binding example. So, we have just swapped it. Okay. So, uh, that, that is one of the motivation of doing it, but, but in a general speaking case it could be the other way around also. We could have put O 1, O 4, O 3, O 2 here and we could have put temp 1 here and temp 2 here that is also possible. So, that is I mean uh, the very logically speaking if you are moving O 4 here. So, we should also bring temp 2 over here and if you are putting O 2 over here. So, we should logically put temp 1 over here because they are I mean they are binded to O 2, but actually in a very general case I mean you can try also with this one like uh, you can keep uh, this uh, what do you call this uh, uh, register. Uh, binding fixed and we could have said that O 1, O 4, O 3, O 2 that is also possible and then we can study the area. So, that is why I told you that uh, different type of options are possible. So, different type of binding options will be there and then you have to find out that which one is actually giving you the minimum possible area. So, that is the uh, core idea of the algorithm that will be developing to solve the problem. So, in this case we have put some uh, because we are not trying at present we are not trying some algorithm we are just thinking on our brains as a human being we are just looking at the diagram and trying to find out which allocation uh, sorry which binding will give you a 
less area kind of a thing. So, we are actually putting temp 2 over here, temp 1 over here that we are swapping and all those things we are doing. But you have to remember that in a general case all these things may be again having a permutation combination. Like we could have um, said B and C over here and E and F over here. We could also make B and E over so, uh, uh, so, uh, yep, yeah. So, we could have uh, done this way also. Okay. So, we could also put out oh, instead of this we could also, also put out one here also we could have put. So, any type of permutation combinations are possible. So, all those things are actually the algorithm which will try to do the best binding for us we will try to have to see all the permutation combinations possible among this and then have they have to pick up which is having the least area. So, you can understand how difficult the problem is. So, if you recall I was always telling that all the problems generally VLSI design problems are NP hard and NP complete. So, very quickly we will see that this is also an NP complete problem that is which will we do not know any good polynomial time or we do not know any polynomial time algorithm which will solve the problem. So, you can see that I have to try all permutation and combinations that is O 1 O 4 O 3 O 2 then the all different permutation combinations like A here uh, temp 2 here out here out 1 here and maybe other combinations. So, so, all possible combinations of both register as well as operation binding has to be tried and then you have to find out for each of this binding what is the area required in case of interconnection and then you have to find out for which one it will be the least area for which case the area will be the least that you have to consider as the best and you have to say that this binding is taking the minimum interconnect area and this is the best binding. But you can understand by, by permutation and combination there can be so many different uh, the number of different type of permutations possible will be very very high in fact exponential or maybe much more than exponential number of different permutations will be possible in this case. And in a general case where there will be hundreds of registers and hundreds of functional units. So, this may blow up like anything and we will not get any feasible number of feasible solution in a very reasonable amount of time. And again for each of this sheet bindings what you have to do you have to find out the area. So, that is again another cost that is coming into picture. So, what you have to do? So, you have to see that our step is first try each of the permutation and combination possible. So, the combinations are very very high in number and for each combination you have to find out what is the area overhead for the interconnect. Then you have to find out which is the least and you have to do. So, you can find out exponential problem on top of there there is another uh, sub, sub module that is coming into picture that is actually you have to find out the area overhead because of the multiplexing arrangement for the interconnects for each of them. So, that is why again you, it, is, it is impractical to solve this using a uh, what do you call an exponential algorithm or a, what do you call, call a exact algorithm. So, what we have to do we generally go on for about heuristics to solve the problem and then we can find out that this 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 binding is a near optimal kind of binding may not be the best one but the time required will be very reasonably low. So, again like our uh, scheduling case we also see different algorithms today. So, which will actually give you a binding solution, but that may not be the best. Okay. So, now let us see over here. So, in this case if you see so 1 O 4 O 3 O 2 and this is the binding which is written A temp 2 out 1 B and F D temp 2 out 2 okay temp 1 out 2 and E and C. So, first case you see uh, A will be connected to the uh, this uh, register through uh, the input port and then uh, O 1. So, A plus B it will generate out 1. So, okay, so now here actually if you see we are using O 2. So, O 2 operates on temp 1 plus C. So, in this case this interconnect will be going over here. Okay, so, it will not go back to here as in the previous case. Okay, now, uh, so, in, in step 1 we have generated A 1 plus B and we have generated temp 1. So, this temp 1 is there and it is being fed to the register uh, register 3. Okay. And then in this case if you see it is adding D plus E. So, that is actually temp 1 sorry temp 2. This is the temp 2 that is being now coming over here because O 4 is there. So, O 4 is not O 4 is adding temp 2 plus F over here. So, again the output of this adder will be coming and it is temp 2 is binded to register 1. So, it is coming to a, to a max. So, you require a max over here as in the previous case. Okay. In the time steps 2 what is happening? You are adding temp and F and then you are finally generating the result which is actually out 2. So, again I mean out 2 is binded to this one. So, in this case you have to we have the same uh, output of the same adder which is actually feeding over uh, this uh, mark by this marks to register 3 and out 2 is coming over here. And in this case also you can think that O 2 is an, in the second step it is uh, taking a uh, temp 1 and it is adding with it C and it is uh, generating the value of out 1 and it is again binding it to register number 1. So, this is the interconnection that is being done over here. So, as in the previous case you require two multiplexers because E and C at different control steps are directly connected to the input bus. In first step you will get E, second step you will get C and that can be binded register 4. In this case also it is B and F. So, first step it is B, second step it is F. These variables are binded to register 
two at uh, two different control steps. So, you do not require two wires to do that, but here you require a multiplexer because you are having A from the input bus and in the second and third time step it is temp 2 and out 1. So, you and this is coming out from the output of adder number 2. So, two different port two different ports are there. So, you require a multiplexer and the for the similar reason here also you require a multiplexer. So, two multiplexers are required over here, but you can think that. So, number of multiplexer remains the same, but you can see that these are some, some criss cross wirings are there. So, there will be some more area required because of the routing of this net. So, this option is actually taking some more area compared to the previous one in terms of interconnect area a little bit because in this case you can see this this was a very neat and a local type of connection this was one local connection this was one local connection. So, the interconnect area would have been less compared to this one, but the number of multiplexer liquids are 2 and 2 and which is the which is similar. Now, let us take the third option okay, and then see what happens in the case of interconnect area. So, we are again taking the O 1 and O 4 O 2 and O 3 actually same same thing we are doing. So, uh, O 1 and O 4 is binded over here O 3 and O 2 are binded over here. So, that is the same thing as the last example and now we are saying thing A temp 1 and out 2 are binded to register 1 O temp 1 out 2 are binded to this one in this case B and F that is same D temp 2 and out 1 are added over here D temp 2 and out 1 are binded over here and E and C are binded over here. Okay, sorry, O3 and E are binded over. So, now let us see what is the area requirement. So, now let us see how you do. So, you can see over here that I require two multiplexers, additional multiplexers over here. So, how do we come about it? Let us see. So, in time step 1, so what is required? You require to do uh, A plus B, and in this case, you require to do E D plus E. You generate temp 1, you generate temp 2, correct? That is what is the required. So, same multiplexing arrangement will be there. Okay, so, it is taking A here and it is taking B here and what is it is doing? It is generating value of temp 1. So, in this case temp 1 is binded to register 1. So, you have to take this back and you are writing it over here. So, not a problem it is done. So, temp 1 is done over here right and in this case also you are taking D plus E to temp 2. So, temp 2 is binded over here. So, you take D over here E over here the addition is done the output is coming over here and temp 2 is binded here. So, this is the connection for this one you require a multiplexer over here because D and output from the register they are coming to register 3 and here also A and output A that is input bus and output from the output from the output of register adder 1 so is coming to register number 1. So, you require a multiplexer this is the same reason in the last two example cases. Okay. Now, let us see the second control step for which we require two more multiplexers here and here. So, what is the second control step? Second control step we are doing as temp 1 plus you require C to generate out 1 and temp 2 plus F you generate out 2. Now, you can see we have done a mistake. So, here we have temp 1 okay, and what do we what do you require more? So, temp 1 is available here that is not a problem. So, temp 1 is uh, what do you where is temp 1 available? So, this is temp 1. So, I should not write here temp 2 here I write temp 2. Okay. So, now here temp 1 is available. So, temp 1 is available at this port you can understand. So, this is nothing but temp 1 at this control step okay. and what is available at this port. So, at this port if you can think temp 2 is available. So, temp 2 is available at this point and here temp 1 is available. So, uh, now I should write uh, this uh, I should write just temp 1. So, temp 1 is available over here at the time being okay, for the time being temp 1 is available and here actually for the time being temp uh, for the time being let us not see this temp 2 is available at this port. Okay. So, now uh, what happens? So, you have to add uh, temp 2 this is temp 1 you have to add along uh, along with this you have to add C okay. and then you can generate the value out 2 out 1 sorry you have to you get the value of out 1. Now, you see the big problem you are actually having O 2 over here. So, if you are having O 2 over here. So, somehow this temp 1 you have to bring this to this adder C is available over here. So, that is not a problem. So, C will come over here, but now again this temp 1 you have to bring it to this adder. So, uh, we bring this temp 1 from here to here through this and also so this is the wire which is actually bringing temp 1 okay, uh, through this. So, this is actually temp 1 if this temp 1 is brought this temp 1 is brought from this register via this one and again you can see O 4 is here. So, in this case what happens you have to add temp 2 plus s to get out 2. So, f is available over here not a problem, but again uh, this temp 1 is not available in the register. So, temp 1 sorry temp 2 you require for O 4. So, temp 2 is not available in register 1. So, temp 2 this is available here. So, that has to be brought here and you have to bring it over here. So, there is some criss cross connections are over here. So, you require another multiplexer over here that is actually making the problem. So, if you just look at the uh, last figure 
what is there. So, O 1, O 4, O 3, O 2 is not a problem. So, what was there if you remember? So, in this case O 4 was available over here, O 4 is here, O 3 is here. So, O 4 requires temp 2 plus f, O 3 requires temp 1 plus C. So, temp 1 was available in register 3 and temp 2 was available in register 1. So, we do not require any kind of crisscross from here or here that was not required. But now, what, what do we have changed in the next example that is temp 1 we have we kept temp, we actually uh, a temp 1 we have allocated over here and we have made it temp 2. So, that is actually creating a problem you see O 4 requires temp 1 which is available in register uh, O 4 requires temp 2 sorry O 4 requires temp 2 which is available in register 3. So, you have to again bring it over here ok and you see O 2 requires temp 1 which is available in register number 1. So, that again has to be brought over here. So, but in, in, in this present case this is not required because temp 1 and temp 2 are stored very near to O 4 and uh, uh, this one is also stored very near to this one. So, we do not require any multiplexing arrangement over here, but in this case as that is uh, that has been done. So, you see so what you have to do. So, O 3 is O 3 actually O 2 requires temp 1 which has been brought by this pin and O 4 actually requires temp 2 which has to be again brought by this wire. So, you require actually two additional multiplexers to do the do the uh, do this uh, uh, do this kind of interconnection binding. So, if you take uh, this type of a combination. So, a multiplexing arrangement requires 1, 2, 3, 4 multiplexers are required and along with that you require see the complexity of wirings over here. So, that uh, means what in a nutshell for this type of a uh, binding you get an area over it which is much higher than the first two cases. So, what uh, so I mean here we have taken some very small arbitrary example and we have tried with different combinations and shows that how area differs. But what I wanted to tell you is that in a real case or when you have to solve the binding problem. So, we have to try with there will be different permutations and combinations for these uh, what do you call this uh, register storage unit binding as well as this adder binding kind of or that is the adder or the function unit binding kind of a case. Now, we have to find out the most optimal one. So, that the interconnect binding in terms of these wirings and these multiplexers the multiplexers and this type of wirings you have you can see that these type of wirings that has to be minimal. So, that is why if you try now if you find out an algorithm which will do it exhaustively search for you and then tell you which is the best one which is going to be a very very difficult problem and you will take enormous amount of time. So, you will not be able to do it. So, we will see some kind of heuristics first we will first we will try to prove that formally that this is a NP complete problem that is very deep there is no well known polynomial time solve to solve the problem then we will find out some heuristics to do that. Okay. So, I mean uh, whatever I told you that uh, why, why do you require two multiplexers in one case and why do you require four multiplexers in the other cases and so forth are written over in this uh, slide. So, you can go through this slide to find out whatever I have told you that why this is actually taking four the other two cases were having taking two and so forth. So, the whatever I told you or whatever I explained you is written over in this slide. So, you can go through this. Now, we are going to go tell you about the algorithm. So, till now we have uh, again we have re emphasized the problem of binding. So, pre in the first lecture of this module we have given you the idea of scheduling allocation and binding problems. Now, again in this case we have again re emphasized the binding problem and we have shown that for different types of uh, what you say um, uh, different types of storage unit and functional unit binding you may get different area in terms of interconnect binding. So, you have to take the best one where the interconnect binding is the least. Okay, so, that is will be the best solution. Now, we are going to see algorithm which can automatically do it for you. Okay, so, again as, I, as in the uh, last case like in the scheduling case we have mapped our problem to what we have mapped our problem to a uh, integer linear program and 0 1 ILP we already know that is NP complete problem. So, here we are trying we will try to match our problem to uh, map our problem to a very well known NP complete problem that is click partitioning. So, what do you mean by click partitioning? I mean if just you have to go to your undergraduate graph theory course. So, it says that even a graph you have to find out a subgraph in which all the nodes from each node to each node there is a path. Okay. So, that is actually called a click. So, you do not take it as a very formal definition for the formal definitions you go to your undergraduate graph theory course, but the basic idea is that given a graph. So, if you can that is called the max if you go for the max click. So, given a graph can you find out a subgraph which is taking the which or maximal subgraph that is the uh, subgraph which can be which, which is having the maximum number of nodes possible from the graph such that from each node to each node of the subgraph that is a click there is a path or there is an edge. Okay. So, uh, so, let us now try to do this. So, in this case what we do? So, here uh, we, we have to actually draw this time the control steps and then we draw the uh, draw the variables as some vertical lines. So, what are the vertical lines? The vertical lines are actually saying that how long is the lifetime. So, A is required only for time step 1. So, its lifetime is only in step 1. Similarly, for B, D, E and 
step one arises after this step first initiation I mean first initial computation is done that is a plus b temp 1 is generated c is generated and d plus e generated temp 2 and f is the input. So, in control step after control step 1 we require temp 1 c temp 2 and f. So, its lifetime is actually in after time step 1. So, after time step 2 you generate out 1 and out 2. So, when the out 1 and out 2 are generated we do not require temp 1 c or temp 2 f or neither of this. So, these actually horizontal lines are representing your lifetime. Say for example, if you have something like say just let me go back say if you could have thought over something like. So, if you should if you have if you would have said that my expression is uh, a plus b plus b. So, let us think about this is a plus b plus b kind of a thing. So, you would have written over this that is a plus b step 1 then again you add with b. So, in this case b is required not only in control step 1, but also in control step 2. So, in this case what would have been your line like diagram. So, in this case your life diagram will be something like this. So, b is also required over this c would not, would not have been there in that case. So, b is required in both time temp 1 and 2 and then you actually generate uh, temp 1 uh, f is fine. So, first you generate temp 1 will be there then temp 1 and again this b is used to generate output 2. So, that is b is required in 2 time step. So, uh, what, what in the other way the, this vertical lines are representing how long or in how much how many control steps this values will be allied. So, this is what is the case. Now, you think how do you map it to a click partitioning problem. So, you know that a and b cannot share a register because they because they are all alive in control step 1. Similarly, temp 1 c temp 2 f they are all required in this step. So, you cannot they cannot share their life and similarly out this one is having out 1 and out 2. So, they control cannot share a variable or say they cannot share a register because they are all alive in this out 1 and out 2 are alive in a common time step. But A and temp 1 can share a register B and C can share a register that is you can think that 4 registers are required over here ok as already mentioned, but these 4 can be shared by any one of this. But again among this temp 1 c temp 2 f they cannot share anything in between. Similarly, out 1 and out 2 cannot share anything in between that is what is the idea. Now, what we do how do you map it to a click problem? So, we have we make nodes for all a b d e temp this one this one this one and this one and this one. Now, you say that a and temp 1 can share a register. So, you join them. Similarly, this one can share a register, this one can, this one can. Similarly, uh, A and, uh, uh, and temp 1 can share, similarly A and C can share, A and E can share, again A and D can also share. Similarly, now if you look at B and this all this stuff, so again B can share between any of these. So, you have edges in between. Now, you also know that B can share sorry, 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 B cannot uh, share in between these two. So, you do not have any edges over here. So, a, sorry again let me just redraw it again. So, this one this A can share with this, A can share with this, A cannot share with this thing. So, there will be no uh, lines from this one to this one only you have some lines from here to here because A, as A and B cannot share a variable. So, there is no uh, edges in between this. Similarly, A and D cannot share. So, there will be no edges in between. Similarly, D and E cannot share a register. So, there will be no connections in between. Okay. Similarly, A and B there is no connection, but A and temp 1 can share. So, there will be a hyphen B and temp 1 can share. So, there will be a edge. A and uh, C can see B and C can share. So, there will be an edge B and temp 1 can share. So, there will be an edge B and F can share. So, there will be an edge. similarly for these cases there will be edges okay, and so forth, but there will be no edges in between. Similarly, A and out 1 can share an edge share a variable register. So, there will be a edge in between A and out can also share something. So, there will be an edge there will be no edge in between this. Similarly, there will be no edges in between this there will be no edges in between this. Okay. So, in other words I mean, let us make it a bit neat. So, if you can see so, there will be edges in between all the nodes accepting there will be no edges from this to no edges in between no edges in between there will be no edges in between no edges in between no edges from this one to accepting this there will be edges in all between. Okay. Now, so this is what your, your graph will look like. So, you see A B C D there is no edges in between there is no edges, but from out 1 you have connections to A B C D then from out 1 you have to temp C and this one. So, this is what is your graph. So, your graph a connection a connection is having between these two if and only if they do not share the lifetime or they can be shared uh, they can be shared a uh, register. Now, what you have to do now click partition will tell you that how you, you divide it into maximum clicks that is you have to divide it into some maximum size subgraphs such that they are a click. Click means uh, so this is a click. So, from this node you can go here from this node you can go here from this node you can go here you can go here. So, from each node you can go to any other node ok all the other nodes in the graph. So, that is actually a click 
Now, in this case, you have to find out the largest possible subgraphs of this so that there is a click. Now, how it is actually solving your uh, problem? How is it? How is it actually solving your uh, uh, binding problem? Because say we find out, so if you can solve the problem that is largest size of graphs from where you can reach each node, so actually you are getting one, it is one solution. So, there can be multiple solutions to this. What do you mean by multiple solutions? That can be multiple uh, different permutations and combinations of these nodes. So, like for example, here it is finding out out one a temp. So, this is one click, b and c is one click, this is one click and this is one click. So, you can also find out this another possibility will be like a in this case it will be say uh, b uh, sorry uh, in this case it will be say sorry a out 1 let me just draw there will be another there can be another solution like a this is out 1 in this case instead of temp 1 you can have temp 2 and you can have this one. So, let this be b c sorry b c in this case then it will be out 2 in this case it will be d in this case it is temp 1 joining and in this case it is e and f. E and F. So, this is one another solution. So, there can be lot of other solutions uh, for this click. So, it does not say that there is a unique solution, there is one solution. So, but what do you mean by mixed click? Max click that is maximum number of nodes possible in a subgraph is 3. Okay, so, we cannot have another subgraph having 4 nodes so that you can reach from each node to each node. From here you can see you can go here, you can go here and you can go here. So, what we have found out? We have found out that there is a maximum of uh, this uh, 3 nodes can be possible in a subgraph that is actually can where is the click that is going to go from each node to another. So, now the uh, algorithm which can find out. So, given a graph like this any arbitrary graph then you can find out whether is a max click of 3 or whether or what are the max clicks that exists in the graph is an NP complete problem. That is a very well known uh, NP complete problem is click partitioning that whether given a uh, graph with say k n, n nodes whether there is a k max click possible uh, whether there is a k click possible is also a NP complete problem because there is no well known polynomial time solution for this. So, the more form these are all there were this is uh, mapping to NP completeness and definitions of NP completeness I am keeping a bit uh, superficial or what you can call not very formal quote unquote very formal in the lecture because this is a course on CAD. So, I am just dealing you what is the problem and how it is mapped to this one, but for a very formal notion on this and how uh, uh, how the how the click or max click problem is an NP complete problem and why is it so? You are required to go for go for any uh, theoretical computer science book there is, or any complete complexity analysis book and you will be able to find out. But what is the idea here? So, the any algorithm given a graph like this that can tell you that there is only 3 nodes possible in a max click is a NP complete I mean you do not do not have any polynomial time algorithm for that. Now, so say if say even if I have a very long time possible with me, so what I can do? is that I can I mean pump in as many times as possible and then I can say that this is what has been available. Now, how it how does it solves my binding problem? The answer is that it is saying that this is the number of clicks possible. Now, you say that this is for register 1, this is for register 2, this is for register 3 and this is for register 4. How is that possible? Because you see we have said that we have a connection between these two if and only if the variable of out 1 variable of this the vari lifetime of this variable, this variable, this variable do not overlap. If the variable lifetime between a and b has overlap we do not put a edge over here. So, there is no edge between uh, there is no edge between a and b. So, that is why uh, we do not have any uh, uh, connection in between a and b. So, that is the reason why that is the reason why they will never come in one click. So, we have an edge only in between the variables where the where whose lifetimes do not overlap. So, that means this is forming a one click right. So, that means from each edge to from each node to each node we can traverse that is the lifetime of all of them to are not common. So, that is why we can easily have one register which can share this. Similarly, for b and c we have an edge that means what their lifetimes do not overlap. So, we can have one register for them. Similarly, out to d and this one we have we can go from each node to each node that means there is an edge that means their lifetime will not overlap. So, there is a register for that. Similarly, for the last case there is an edge between e and f that is it. So, uh, their lifetimes will not overlap you can have register number 4. So, that is how uh, if you can have a exponential time algorithm. So, also there are a lot of heuristics algorithm to solve this click partitioning problem. So, in this case you get this answer. Now, you saw that the problem therefore, the click partitioning problem is a NP complete problem. There is no polynomial time solution for this, but then what we have then what is there. So, the idea here is that you can look through any theoretical computer science book there are lot of heuristics to solve this click partitioning problem. That is they will take much less time than the exponential time and they will try to 
generate maximum size clicks, but here the solution may not be optimal always that is many times you may not be getting the largest possible clicks out of it. So, what you can get is that you can get some clicks out of it, but the sizes of the clicks may not be maximum. So, if that is not the case then our solution is not optimal why because say in the maximum click 4 nodes could have been tied to one click. Then 4 variables could have been shared by register 1, but the solution will be given will be very near optimal that is it may say that it will give you some 3 nodes which can be possible in a click. So, now these 3 variables will only be shared by register 1, but in the true case or in the best case 4 variables could have been shared. So, that that is sometimes you may get such type of non optimal solutions. Okay. So, but anyway, but the, of that or, the heuristics algorithm will be much faster than the uh, a, a, that is the uh, exponential time algorithm for solving the click, click partitioning problem. So, I am not going to tell you about the heuristics that are available for uh, this click partitioning problem because they are very, very well known in computer science, theoretical computer science area. So, you can see any uh, heuristics uh, which is available for click partitioning and any of them can suffice. So, what we have uh, done in this class is that we have mapped the well known problem of uh, click or well known I mean the scheduling sorry the binding problem to click and then we have shown that it is an NP complete problem and there are very very lots of well known heuristics to solve the click partitioning problem. So, you can apply any one of them and you can find out a click and for all the variables in a click you can share a register, but again then the problem is that if your solution is suboptimal in most in, in case of heuristics then you may not have the la all maximum possible uh, nodes or maximum possible variables in a click. So, for where in the case some n variables could have been shared by a register some n minus k variables would be shared by the register so, that is actually will be happening. Okay. So, whatever I told you now in, in my lecture is actually written over this slide that how the click partitioning problem is or how the ceiling problem is by sorry binding problem is mapped to the click partitioning problem and what are the optimizations and what is the max click etcetera. So, you can just go through the slides. Okay. Now, we will take another algorithm which is called the left edge algorithm to again solve the same problem. So, in this case what we do? So, in this case we actually first step is that we arrange the variables in some ascending or ascending order of their lifetimes. Okay. So, A, B, C, D. So, they are actually arising in the first step. So, we put it there. Then temp 1, temp 1 C, temp 2 F they come in the second step. So, we put it over here and then finally, out 1 and out 2 we put it over here. So, we first arrange in this one and there is one more thing that if there are uh, we, uh, okay. So, if there are more than one variable at the same level then actually uh, then you are uh, uh, ordered in the last control steps. That is let me just tell about this. So, in the ascending order say there is some variable like this. Say let us assume that B is having like this. Okay. It is saying if there are more than one variable at the same level in the order because of the same starting control step, okay, then those variables are ordered based on the last control step that is very important. So, it is saying that we are ar 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 arranging all the variables in the order of the start of the life, I mean start of their life cycle. Like the left edge algorithm, we first sort in ascending order the variables according to the starting step of their lifetime. So, A, B, C, D and E, they all start their lifetime at 1. So, they are arranging in 1. Now, if there is some variable say that it is actually running to lifetime 2, okay, then some variable ordering will be changed, I mean the or, or, or range of ordering is changed. Like how? For example, if there are 3 variables A and C, where A has a lifetime from step 1 to step 3. So, let us just do that. So, it is step 1 to step 3 kind, then B has a lifetime from step 1 and step 2 okay, and C has a lifetime from step 2 to step 3. So, let us do not forget this. So, let us think about this. So, it is a step 2 to 3 something like this, then the order will be A, B and C. So, in this case what happens? So, this is the longest one, this is the second this one and this one is the third one. So, you will be arranging in this one. So, we start uh, we start the arrangement or start the order from the life starting of the lifetime and uh, then uh, in the same level if there are more than one variables then they are ordered based on the last control step. So, in this case if you see this is learning for the maximum sorry this is running for the maximum amount of time that is its end lifetime is 3 and in this case it is 2. So, you order A before B that is what is being said. So, in other words very simply you can say that we arrange all the variables in uh, you start uh, you arrange all the variables in some order based on the lifetime. So, you start with the starting point of the lifetime and then you arrange it and if in the same level say there are uh, this type of stuff. So, this may be very long this may be shorter this may be this long and so forth. So, in this case what you do again if this uh, the longest one will be the in the first. So, this is going for the maximum length of time. So, you put it over here then this is going only two this will be third and this is going the third second longest one. So, you put it over here. So, maximum is the lifetime. So, it will come before the one which is having a lower lifetime that is the idea. So, uh, one having a lifetime of 10 starting at point 1 will be higher in order than the one having a lifetime of 3 and also starting from 1. So, that is the idea. 
Okay. And even if c is having a lifetime of 20, still it will be after a because we start with the starting point of the lifetime. So, a is starting at 1 and running for 10 units say and c is starting from 2 and running for 20 lifetimes. So, a will be first, c will be next because we start with the lifetime starting point and then if there is something like a and a and but in this case b uh, the c will be later because c is starting at point 2. Okay, but if there is something like a is running 10 and b is running for 20 then b will come ahead of a. So, that is what is being told in this slide. Now, where to do? Now, it is very simple. Now, we actually take some buckets or we set some registers and keep on filling it. So, this is a very simple algorithm you will see. So, in this case we have a bucket like this. Okay, empty bucket and then we start from this side. Then we say that A, okay, fill it, fill A over here. Next, you go for B, B cannot be filled over here because this part is already allocated. So, D also cannot be filled over here because this part is already booked, E is also there, it is already filled. Now, you go for temp 1, easily temp 1 can be filled over here because this part of the bucket was empty. Then C, temp 2 and F cannot be filled because this bucket part is the bucket is full, but very easily out 1 can be filled over here. So, now this bucket is full. Okay, now, what you do? You, one iteration is complete that is from step 1, step 2, step 3. So, now again you take another bucket. Now, A is already gone. So, B is there. So, B will be over, B will be here. Then D and E cannot be filled because this part of the bucket is full. Then C temp was already gone. So, you will fill up C over here. This will be C okay, and so forth. So, this is how your bucket looks like. You start you with A, you fill up A. Then in this bucket 1, you cannot fill B, C, D or E, sorry B, D and E cannot be filled. So, you can fill only temp 1 can be filled. So, you have to fill temp 1 over here and then again in this case the out 1 will be filled. Now, this bucket is full. So, you take R 1, R 2. So, R 2 B will be filled in the first, D and E cannot be filled, then C will be filled and out 2 will be filled. Now, in this case, oh sorry, what will be is going to happen is this will be over, this 2 will be over, these 2 guys will be over. In the third and fourth bucket, you will have D and temp 2 and E and F in the fourth bucket. So, in this case, you can fill and then you are done. So, now the what are these see all the buckets? These buckets are nothing but they are your registers. So, in this case, you have 4 registers and these are the variables you it. So, this is another very simple algorithm and a very simple solution. So, this is also solving your left edge uh, algorithm is also solving your binding problem and here you can find out the solution is not at all exponential. It is a very polynomial time problem because you have to just take a bucket and see if everything can be filled up. So, I am not going to the formal analysis, but you can very easily find out that it is much much it is a very simple procedure. You have to just check some wires in the bucket and if required you have to fill up the uh, some uh, what you call these uh, variables in the bucket. So, it is a very simple problem and a very simple solution. So, and you can get your solution. Okay. And if you use this, uh, this A temp 1 out 1, B C out 2, D temp 2 and E and F, if you take this, so here you are going to get this type of an arrangement. So, you can see we require 4 multiplexers. So, you can just study and find out is A temp 1 out 1, B C out 2, D temp 2, E and F. So, this is, if this is your binding. So, this one is this one is going to be your architecture. So, you can see that we require 4 registers that is, so, sorry, you see you require 3 multiplexers. So, in the best case we have found that we require only 2 multiplexers and the wiring was very simple. So, in this case you see there is actually also a criss cross among the wiring as well as you require 3 multiplexers. So, this solution is not an optimal solution. So, in other words, so why do I say now let us, uh, so actually you see, uh, so this is the left edge algorithm what is done. So, this is taking a very simple procedure, it is just filling up the buckets and you are uh, then finding out what is the area required. So, in this case you find out the area required is 3, uh, what you say is required 3 multiplexers. So, that is a big problem for you. So, the area is not optimized. So, uh, we can see that binding uh, what you call say this uh, left edge algorithm is also heuristic algorithm kind of a thing. I will again come in the more in the elaborate sense in the question answer session that why it happened that uh, why you are getting a 3 variables in this case that means what the left edge algorithm is not giving you a very optimal solution. So, we will see why, what happens, but you have to understand here that the algorithm we are using to solve the left edge problem is not a heuristic, it is a very exact algorithm because there is nothing to do, we are not I mean taking any kind of randomization, we are not taking anything that we are not trying to search the whole subspace or so forth. So, what we are doing is that we are taking some buckets and we are trying to fill it up. So, just filling it up all the buckets, but it is not giving you an optimal solution. So, why is that? Because the, the, uh, the left edge uh, algorithm or the left edge, uh, the way the left edge algorithm is designed is uh, actually not a very powerful algorithm to solve the problem in a most optimal way. So, what people do? They people sometimes do it by the third type of algorithm which is called the re iterative refinement. So, iterative refinement they actually merge with the left edge algorithm and then they try to solve the problem. So, what they will do? Now, they find that you have taken 3 multiplexers for this. Now, they will iterate. That is what they will do? They will try to say shuffle out 2 from here to here and then they may try to say that I will bring out this out 2 from here and I may try to put it over here. That is one way of doing it. Some, that's some other combination they may try. They may also try to say that I may try to put uh, 
B and C over here, E and F is fine, they could also try to reshuffle. So, in this case, I mean, you can try with one variable, you can try with two variables, all the reshufflings you can try. So, you have down A temp 1 out 1, B C out, you can move over from here to here. This is one reshuffle you can do. Or I mean, you can try out also with this one, you can take out out from here to here, sorry, out 1, you can take it from here to over and you can try. So, some reshuffles you can do and then you can find out what is the area, 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 area overhead because of the multiplexer arrangements and you keep on doing it. And if you find out that if I, you can, you can easily find out that if I move out one from here to here, then actually we will take, we will go to the very previous, I mean uh, this stuff you will go up to, if you do that, you will go to our first uh, this thing, uh, you will go to this one, this is the first thing. So, in this case A temp 1 out 1 B C and here you have out 2. Okay, and the first very simple structure you will get up only two multiplexes that is our original example, start example if you see that will that will be landing up to. So, if you just reshuffle this one from here to here. So, the idea is in is of iterative refinement is that you get a solution from the uh, what you call you get a solution from the left edge and then keep on iterating with these values by reshuffling different permutations and combinations of this allocation bindings and then if you find that the new shuffling has resulted in a lower area compared to the previous one you retain it and you keep on doing it as long as you have time. You can say say the threshold then that I want to try with 30 iterations and whatever is the best solution I will take it. So, th that those things are actually heuristics that is iterative refinement along with left edge if you mix up you will get a heuristic solution. Okay. And then what is the idea? So, you keep on doing it if you have said that I have lot of time I will give 5 days to solve the problem then it will try or it will explore a very large number of state space or space of this uh, binding problem and then try to give you a better solution. But if you have a very less time then also you will get, get a solution in case of this iterative refinement plus left edge but the solution may not be optimal. Like if you try with the first step. So, without any iterative refinement your answer is 3 which is not an optimal solution. But if it is with this some kind of this replacement you will get a you will get the op most optimal solution in this case. But for a bigger example it may happen that you may take n number of time steps required or n number of iterations may required to go to a optimal solution or near optimal solution. But in case of uh, is that what do you call the click partitioning the problem is uh, that uh, the problem is in the click partitioning is that whatever you do, I mean if you are going to get an exact solution for click partitioning, so it is going to be an exponential time re requirement and you will get the best solution, but the time requirement will be very, very high. So, what people will do? People will go for uh, heuristic versions of uh, this click partitioning to get the solution. So, that is one area. So, you can solve this binding problem in two ways. So, one you can do is that map it into click problem, click partitioning problem and do not use a uh, exact algorithm. You uh, use some heuristics for solving the click partitioning problem, you will get a solution which will be the near optimal one. Otherwise, what you can do? You go for iterative refinement and keep sorry you go for left edge and keep on doing iterative, in, uh, iterative refinement as long as you have time. Then also you are going to get a solution in a reasonable amount of time which may not be the uh, best one, but it will be near optimal one. So, we have seen two uh, I mean uh, the two different type of solutions I mean two different type of algorithms to solve the uh, binding problem. So, as I told you if you go for this ref refreshment that out 2 with null that is you are actually in, in this case we have some out 2 over here. So, this out 2 you are moving it over here. So, it is a very simple structure you are going to get it and in, in, in this is a small example. So, in the first iteration itself, iterative refinement itself you are getting the best solution, but that may always may not be the true one. Okay, so, before we close over, so we are going to the question answer session. Okay, so, now we know that least scheduling provides an optimal binding solution in P time as click partitioning requires exponential time for the same quality of solution. Why then click partitioning is not considered obsolete? Now, we have to understand what is the meaning of this. So, the click partitioning as we already know takes a exponential number of time exponential solution to get the current answer. But for click or but for uh, what you can call list uh, list scheduling the solution is in P. So, what does it mean list part uh, list uh, what you can call the list uh, what you say the list scheduling if you do not merge with this uh, iterative refinement then itself it itself is an algorithm or itself is a solution. It will take some buckets try to fill up the variables over there and it will give you a solution. So, itself it, it itself is a solution. You if you merge it with iterative refinement then you can get better and better solutions and that in all becomes a heuristic. But if I decouple uh, iterative refinement with list partitioning still list partitioning stands in itself is a solution. And you can understand that the solution is very, very simple. So, what it does? It actually just fills up some buckets and it gives the solution. Okay, then it, it is done in very less amount of time. But then why we are going for click partitioning based one or why we are actually merging iterative refinement with uh, what uh, this uh, what do you it is or why do you want to merge iterative refinement with this list scheduling? Why do you want to do that? The answer is list partitioning uh, sorry list uh, list scheduling sorry sorry I mean uh, this is not list scheduling it is this is actually or is not list scheduling it is actually this left edge sorry left edge. 
Okay, so the problem is we know that left edge provides an optimal binding in peak time when the click uh, partitioning takes exponential time. So, it is not the least scheduling is the solution scheduling issue uh, scheduling algorithm. So, it is left edge. We know that left edge provides optimal binding in p time whereas, the click partitioning requires exponential time. Okay, then why is it? So, as I told you left edge is nothing but actually it takes uh, so some variables and put it into the bucket that is how it is done. But, the, but still you can see that it does not give an optimal solution because in our case it gave a solution of 3 multiplexers. So, and uh, if you merge it into iterative refinement then it is a heuristic one, but let us decouple it for the time being. But you see why we require click partitioning. So, in click partitioning you can think is that we can this is a very popular algorithm and it is only the one that is mainly used because we can put some weights. So, what is the weights like we can say here that we are having R 1, R 2 and R 3. Okay, so, in this case we also show, showed that there can be different other so, uh, solutions like A, then it was out 1 and this is temp 2 kind of a thing and this is the connection. We okay, so some other, this is not, this is the one solution, this was say this will be the other solution. Okay, now, whether you take this solution or whether you take this solution, that means in case of temp 1, let us say it is temp 2 and this is temp 1. So, this is the other solution. So, we can put some weights in the edges, like you can say that if I merge it, if I merge uh, uh, the out 1 with temp 1, then I can say I add put a weight 2. So, where from you will get weight and say in case I put say out 2 with temp 2, if I merge, I say a weight of 3. So, where from these weights will come? The weights can be derived by another heuristic mechanism or some other mechanism saying that if I merge out 2 with temp 2, then what will be the requirement of marks multiplexers or how many more? Uh, additional um, uh, interconnect bindings or interconnect or what do you say interconnect uh, area in terms of multiplexers or wiring length will be required if I bind these two. Similarly, if I again bind these uh, two with another thing, so this two that means if I bind out two with them two more area will be required kind of a thing. So, that type of weights you can put over here. So, that you can think that which solution whether I should merge out one with temp one or out one with temp two. So, we actually in fact have a connection here also. So, you can think that whether out one with temp one is a better solution or out one with temp two is a better solution. So, you can put some weights that is if you merge A with out 1 or out 1 with temp 1. So, if you do this, then which is going to give you a better solution? So, those weights that if you merge these two nodes, what will be the impact on the area over it because of interconnect binding. So, some weighted weights you can put and then you can run the algorithm. So, it will, it will, what it will do? It will try to find out the solution which is actually the click partition solution and the weights and, and edges will be merged or nodes will be merged only in the cases where the weights are very less. So, that means you can embed some more stuff into your click partitioning based solution. That is when you have to, how you do this merging so that you get a op more optimal solution compared to some other other uh, avenue of the solution. So, if there is solution 1, 2, 3, so we can put some weights in the edges. So, it, it can automatically guide you that whether solution 1 is good or whether solution 2 is good or whether solution 3 is good. So, all these weights etcetera can be put over here, but you can think that your left edge algorithm is very simple. You just have to fill up the buckets. So, there is no option, no choices, there is a single solution and that may not be a optimal solution and uh, that has been case in the case of the example. So, in this case we have to also put iterative refinement to make it a better one. So, with this we uh, I mean, uh, stop the discussion on algorithms uh, for scheduling allocation and binding this high level synthesis on the second in the second module. So, in the next module what we are going to discuss that once our high level synthesis is done you are get a, you have got a RTL design or a bla black box architecture design. Now, how we can use them to get a gate level design that is called the gate level synthesis. So, in the next module we will be focusing on that. Thank you. Thank you.